Aloha, this is Rosa McAllister, and welcome back to On Being a Service Warrior, interviews with the firewalkers among us. Those who have had their struggles and yet have chosen to come out the other side into lives of service for others. Click subscribe and tap the notification bell to keep up with future episodes of this ongoing series. If this is your first time joining us, don't forget to catch up with other episodes in this series, as well as other offerings in Network's YouTube channel. Mahalo, thank you, and always remember you are the light, be the light. Hi everyone, aloha all. One of my greatest joys in doing this interview series is to reconnect with and better introduce to the world some of my favorite people. And today may be the best of all. Mary Lapos has been a very dear friend of mine for several decades now. Someone who I rarely get to see in the flesh anymore, but is in my heart always. I first got to meet and know Mary as part of both of our work in the disability world as both of us were a bit renegade, I think, and looking for comrades. And I think we found that in each other. Um, <laughs> our, re- our relationship grew, learning we had many things in common, including spiritual pursuits, views of the world, and sarcastic, sometimes caustic humor. Um, I'll let Mary tell you more about herself through this interview, but suffice it to say that this amazing person has lived several lives, and I don't think she's done yet, and has been at the forefront of helping this world spin a little more in balance and has certainly helped my world do so. So folks, I have an incredible, wonderful treat for you in meeting Mary Lapos. Is this where I jump in? (laughs) You can, sure. And then I'll ask some questions and we'll go back and forth. And for the record, as I always tell people, I know I've already told you this, Mary, but, um, you know, this is a, a series where we're just talking and people are getting to know others that I've gotten to know. Um, and it's share what you care to share, what you wish to share. As I always say, we are not doing therapy here, so I'm not going to push or pull. I have five basic questions that I've already sent to you and you are fully aware and I will not pry or punch or poke into areas that are not our business. So it's up to you to share whatever you would like to. Well, um, first of all, I don't remember if I read the questions or not, but I did watch (laughs) other interviews. So if I don't sound forthcoming, it's only because you need to prompt me with whatever it is uh, you want to know. I don't really mind you asking anything i'm pretty much of an open book anymore doesn't bother me thank you and thank you again for doing this this is just fun to see you and talk to you miles and miles away i know you know so mary is in central pennsylvania on her beautiful incredible gorgeous farm and i'm far away in hawaii and you can tell we're dressed a little differently temperatures are a little different here right now (laughs) <laughs> I thought maybe you might be telling me you're moving to Cuba after all of your fun times uh, there. I love Cuba, but I'm, I don't know. think I'm. I don't think that I'm going to be moving there. Visiting, oh. yes, yeah, very much a part of my life, but nah, Maui kind of has me. Well, I don't blame you. Maui mm-hmm. has uh, everything. Pretty much. Pretty mm-hmm. much. Yeah. Yeah. So to get us started. So tell us, who are you? Who is Mary Lapos? Uh And if it's a little easier or different, or you want to throw it in there, if we were to have me and a bunch of other close friends of yours answer that question, how might we answer it? How would you answer it? How do you think maybe others would? Well, I I realized, uh, not at first, when I heard you talking to the other people you interviewed, that I had already uh, figured out that answer uh, quite a while ago. (laughs) Uh, A friend of mine recently had said to me that I was an outlier and uh, I am. Uh, That can mean a lot of things, but, but more to the point, um, this, 
this pandemic thing has made me realize that I'm still exactly who I think I am uh, and have thought I am for quite a while uh, because it isn't changing my life much. I, I'm here at the farm, uh, which I always am anyway. I'm a painter, so that's a solitary pursuit. Um, I'm a wannabe musician, which I have that stuff in my studio here. And um, nothing much has changed for me in my life, except I don't make the odd trip into town anymore. My daughter does that for me because she goes to work. And so I'm here uh, in the place where I have grown into um, the person I am today. But I, I did dig out the, the quote that I've used for years when I have art shows. And when I show in particular, I don't even know if you can see it, there's a painting down here called um, uh, In the Midst of Impermanence which I have felt uh, is where we're all at all the time and never more than now. Uh, but it, uh, it, it afforded me uh, some real clarity. Um, I didn't go on and on like I am now. So I, I dug it out and, and I'll end up reading it to you because it's not long. And I usually don't like to see people read things on videos, but it's a no, please, please sort, of, do. sort of a Victorian uh, source, uh, William Henry Channing. He was a writer, philosopher, whatever, in the 1800s. And um, I happened across this, like I said, years ago, decades ago. And here's what he said. And I thought, bingo, there it is. Thank you, Henry. To live content with small means, to seek elegance rather than luxury, and refinement rather than fashion, to be worthy, not respectable, and wealthy, not rich, to listen to stars and birds, babes and sages, with open heart, to study hard, to think quietly, act frankly, talk gently, await occasions, hurry never. In the word, to let the spiritual the unbidden and unconscious grow up through the common. This is my symphony. And that's been the way it's been for a long time now. So I find that even circumstances like this terrible situation that's engulfing the world, it doesn't change how I feel about anything. It's like, that's who I am. And I, I, I'm, I take a great deal of comfort in the words he uses because they aren't words that I would have thought of. And yet, when you see them in writing like you do in all of literature, you think, there it is, poetry or dance. There it is. And there it is. Uh, I just, um, I realized I've been living side by side with you for years now. And I didn't have to come up with an answer to your question. Uh, I don't think I have anything else for the rest of the questions, but I had for this opening, opening little folly. So that's, um, that's who I am. That's how I live my life. That's and why I'm an outlier. <laughs> that's why you're what? I'm sorry, an outlier? Mm -hmm. An outlier, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I would agree. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And I think it does describe you to a T very, very yeah, well. It does. I mean, maybe, maybe I was William Channing in another life. Maybe I was, maybe we knew each other. Maybe, um, maybe we're just changing roles in our groups that we travel in over time. There's another one of my little things that I feel I pretty much believe in. Mm. We just change roles. Mm -hmm. I could, I can understand that. Absolutely. Sort of pods of people that... Mm -hmm. kind of show up in the same mm -hmm. same path but we're we're different in one we're a mother and one we're a you know 
a rat, or, but we're all kind of in the same hangout. We're, we're sort of traveling together. We get to find out about all of it. I like that. And just to reference for people watching, because somebody might be watching this in 10 years and heaven help us. I hope it's like some are saying in the future, it'll just be known as a bad flu. But we are going through, this is March, the end of March of 2020 that we're meeting and recording this. And so the, the pandemic and the virus that we're talking about is the COVID-19 as it's known. And it's um, where many of us are in lockdown or shelter in place. We have whole new vocabulary right now. And some of us, it's a very different mm -hmm. lifestyle, but what you're referencing is it's not for you at all because this primary, this solitary life, this life as an artist and a musician, and I wouldn't say budding at all, um, by the way, but that is your life on the farm, mm -hmm. in your studio. Yeah. And um, I, I respect the virus and I respect the circumstances that have produced this um, state of affairs. Uh, I've been following a I'm not even sure the correct term, it's a scientific term, uh, uh, an area of study, but uh, it's zoonotic something. Anyway, a man uh, was inter being interviewed the other day who's been studying the um, patterns of wild animals and pandemics for probably two or three decades now. And he predicted this one because we are encroaching on so many people or so many species um, by our activities as a species on the planet. And it is the inevitable outcome, so he says. So this one, I think, is practice for getting to what's headed down the pike. Uh, I don't want to alarm people, but I think it helps if people really understand the big picture. Um, and the big picture is we are a species sharing the planet with a lot of other species. Uh, viruses don't necessarily have to be harmful. They serve positive functions too when everything's in balance. But um, as we know well uh, from the last 10 years or so with climate change and um, e emerging uh, problems like this that uh, things are out of balance badly. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I, I don't think we can do really much about it until we get that big picture thinking because um, we have to we have to start understanding that the virus isn't the problem we are the problem and nature will balance the scales one way or the other mm -hmm. it's not it's not a happy thought for us but um, I just look at myself as another inhabitant of this planet earth Mm -hmm. And uh, we're all here together and we all will find the solution together because if we don't, nature will take care of it herself, itself, himself, mm -hmm. whatever, whoself. But, uh, you know, yeah, we, we, we have removed ourselves from nature and the life with nature so much that um, it's, it's difficult for a lot of people to remember that we are simply another organism on this planet mm, i'm close true. to it i'm close to it and i live in it every day mm -hmm. and it helps enormously when i have you know when you have that kind of opportunity but um it also um, makes it easier for you to see those kinds of things happening and playing out over and over again and uh, i simply introduce the topic because i think it's something that everybody will be talking about in five or ten years uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. But so, so you didn't get this wise, this learned, just out of nowhere. So I'm curious about, and I'm always curious about the path, the journeys that people have taken in their life or that life has taken them. And as I oftentimes, as you know, I've been involved with helping people think about their lives and speak their truths mm -hmm. and their dreams for a long, long time. Lots of people who have not done that, who people we didn't think could do that, could have a dream, could have anything. A lot of folks that we know and love very well. Um, and 
it's always struck me when I talk with people and ask them about their life's journey, their story. So many times we remember events and specific situations. And I'm always more interested in the chapters, the chapters of lives. And so I'm wondering if you walk us through some of your chapters. What, have your, what has your life been about? And how did you get to the point where you are, artist, musician, sage, Mary? Well, I think of my life as a series of stories, which is pretty close to what you just said. Um, I don't know if I've got them collected in chapters, but I'd like, to, I'd like to. A friend of mine and I talk about producing a book, but I don't want to have another paper product floating around, so it'll probably be an audio something or other, or Maybe technical. this is it. Or maybe, maybe this well, maybe is the beginning of it. Of it. Maybe, maybe we're doing it right here today. Um, I remember uh, being really, really sick as a child. I grew up in an oxygen tent. And uh, they didn't have uh, many things to throw at a kid who was chronically uh, consumed by pneumonia, bronchitis, um, et cetera, et cetera. And they didn't understand the process very well. So um, eventually the, the whole thing came together is that I was asthmatic and, um, and penicillin was in, uh, invented just as I was probably a year old, whatever. And so it's probably why I'm here today. So it should have been my, maybe my name I took, a confirmation or something. Middle name, <laughs> penicillin. Penicillin. <laughs> penicillin, because both of my parents were nurses, which was an unusual situation to begin with, to have a father who was a nurse. Um, but anyway, so he was my primary medical person all the time and when my grandchildren today talk about hating to get the flu shots and hating to get blood taken and you know because of the needles i think back it, it uh, i should have probably dug one out i think they're around here somewhere the needles that my father used to use to give me penicillin shots they were sort of as big as your middle finger and they were made of glass and uh, they were like frosted glass. I remember these details because they filled my life when I was little. And the needles were probably as big, <laughs> they seemed to me like a knitting needle. They were so big. And my dad and I used to barter for hours to get me to take the shot. And um, so I learned sort of a stoic approach to life when I was very young. And I also learned how to be alone when I was very young because I spent days on open wards in an oxygen tent because there were no private rooms then. And, uh, but the positive thing that came out of all of that is that all the relatives used to visit me and bring me coloring books. And I must have filled dozens of them. And that was the beginning of my art career. Because, and if someone brought me a new box of crayons with the pointy tips and the nice smell when you open up those boxes, you know, and they only had eight crayons in them then, you know, was, I didn't expand until Crayola got inventive and started marketing more. But that I lived for that and the pencil boxes that came with starting school. That's all I needed. That's all I ever needed was a pencil box and filled with new pencils with pointy tips and the crayons. Mm. That was it. I never had uh, any other aspirations except to have them constantly. So I drove my parents crazy, I'm sure. Oh, but how wonderful. I never heard this story. I love this. I can, oh my gosh. So anyway, that was the beginning of my art career. Uh, I didn't realize it. And I went from that to fashion drawing, um, you know, gowns and, and all that. And then I tried to, that, that theme progressed through, through my teens um, with an occasional art lesson by somebody in the town that my dad knew and we'd go for a couple of things and that would be it. Uh, but they used to have little matchbook covers and my mom smoked all the time. So there were always these matchbook uh, 
things that had on the back of them a, a sort of a magazine kind of illustration lady. And if you copied it well enough and sent it in to the address in Connecticut, you could win an art scholarship. So I was doing them all the time, sending them and sending them. And I actually won one until I, and, and I, you know, they mailed me the whole packet and my father looked at it and we were going to Connecticut to see my aunt. So I talked him into taking me to the school, which I can't remember the name of it. And then he heard the price or they'd have to move because I was like nine or 10 or something like that. Well, neither one of those were the options. And he said to me, but you have to make a living. You have to do something. You can make a living. And artists never make any livings. And he was right. And I was mad at the time. But as I got into high school and stuff, I, I understood more of what he was talking about. And I knew I wasn't going to go to art school. And I never even heard of college. Nobody talked about I didn't even know what the word meant. That's how rural this place is where I wow. live. I never heard college mentioned until I was a senior in high school. Oh, nice. I went to a girls' school run by the sisters in our town. And um, my music teacher asked me what college I was going to attend. And I just looked at her like, what? What do you mean? <laughs> so she told me, well, after high school, you can go on, you know, to something. You could become a music teacher. And I just looked at her and I thought to myself, because I was an only child, I could, I, the wheels were just turning like teach music to little kids who make mistakes all the time. It was like, <laughs> you've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. I couldn't do that. I, and then as I, so, you know, I moved on from there to becoming a teacher, but not of music. I was a teacher uh, um, in uh, the disabilities uh, field and um, but my first assignment as a teacher locally here was um, in an elementary school and next door to me was the music teacher's room with a sliding panel and the flutes it was like torture I don't know how the poor man stood it I admired him tremendously because it was awful and I, I got to wearing earmuffs in the classroom and the kids kind of looked at me funny, but they didn't worry about it too much. My supervisor did, but, but, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm muting yeah. in between, but I'm cracking up as you, I can just see you and I can, oh, under, no. knowing you so well, I can understand you were probably like, <laughs> Oh, I was, I was because flutes are like the worst because uh, my my grandson is learning the uh, clarinet right now, and it gets away from you, and and you're just playing along nicely, you know, and then all of a sudden it goes, Wah! and that's what the flutes do. <laughs> they give little kids to learn on, <laughs> and there'll be a whole like group of them in there simultaneously, and it was deafening. And the awful part of it was my classroom was wired because I had several kids who were hard of hearing and had hearing loss, and so the whole classroom was wired so that they could hear all the stuff that was going on and they were ripping their hearing aids out because of the flute lessons. Is it, anyway. Isn't life so interesting how it just throws us those curveballs just you yeah. know and like you said you didn't want to right well how about this? Right yes here take that and so that, that has no bearing on any of the things that, that we've been talking about, except that these little threads just sort of follow me through life. And uh, um, anyway, that, that's one chapter, the Mary growing up and becoming an artist and I started taking piano lessons and, and all of that, and then um, ending up teaching next to the flute teacher. Mm. But it... It was all right. It, it didn't last forever. Um, um, I got another classroom because I was sort of a traveling teacher at the time, and I'd go to different schools over different years. So I didn't permanently live next to the flute teacher. So, Thank goodness. so what other chapters? Oh, my goodness. 
Well, a lot of different things. I don't know what would interest people or what they'd like to know. Um, we, we just, it's not about what would interest others. It's well, what, do you, what are the chapters that happen and or the, the books, the stories that happened or the, and how, and that mm. formed who you are now. I became a lover of literature in high school. We had a very progressive sister uh, teaching certain things, of course, not, not the things I would have really liked to have learned then, but, but I learned to really appreciate a good story. She was great. Um, I'll never forget her. And, um, and she taught me how to diagram a sentence, which I became obsessed about why people probably don't even know what that is anymore. She used to have a game that while we went to lunch, she would put a, a, a big long sentence with like 50 words in it on the board. And then you'd race back from lunch so that you could have a crack at it. Because if you got it done first correctly, then you could uh, get some, I don't know what, pass for the gym or the library or I don't know what. But um, yeah, that, that has affected my life considerably because I, uh, I think it was the foundation for the writing that I do. I do do a lot of writing because I'm much more coherent when I write. And um, I attribute it to Sister Teresa Marie and her diagram lunch opportunity. And from there, I went on to thinking I was going to become a writer And when I finally found out what college was. But I started off in business thinking that had to have something to do with making a living. My father's words were stuck in my craw. Well, I'll make a living. I'll just, and I, you know, soon discovered that was not my forte. But then I was following through on the child, another childhood theme, which was always about, was it fair? I was always the kid on the playground who would back the kid who was getting the short end of the stick or, you know, had had something happen that they couldn't do something and they got in trouble because they couldn't do something. And, and then I would be the champion to like do something about that situation. Always, 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 always on that little bully pulpit to make sure everybody understood what was wrong or what had been done in a way that wasn't satisfactory. I just couldn't leave it alone. So I, I, found that two things happened in college. I found that there was all this stuff going on in public schools with kids who had disabilities and all kinds of problems that I didn't even know anything about. And then I started working at the local mental hospital in the summers as a student worker, social worker, whatever you want to call it, doing music therapy and going to meetings and listening to interviews with patients that sounded more like somebody being interrogated for a crime. And I, I just couldn't believe the state of things. It seemed like I was waiting for people to become much more sensitive and helpful than they were being. Uh, it was the age of new psychotropic drugs, and they were handed out with abandon, it seemed to me. And the last thing I remember about this period of time working at this hospital was a new patient was brought in, and there must have been 50 people sitting around, like watching a bullfight, watching somebody get slowly just annihilated. And the man had not committed a crime. He was a person that was suffering uh, terribly from multiple personality disorder, um, bipolar disorder, the things we didn't really have handles on then. And um, he was publicly humiliated. And I, I was appalled. And um, 
it has formed the rest of my life as far as what do we have to do to give everybody an equal opportunity? What is it will level the playing field? Tell me what to do. That's what I'll, I'll do it. And that pretty much determined um, everything I did from that point on. Um, I kept going with my artwork and I kept going with my music, but the social justice issue became huge for me. And um, for a long time I was, because of my isolated situation um, here in the middle of sparsely populated central Pennsylvania, I was kind of a, a lone wolf and a voice in the wilderness and it, there wasn't much going on that was cutting edge. But gradually people started coming into um, the education system, both the higher education and uh, the organization I worked for delivering services and things started to change. And um, it was while I was getting into that period of time that I think I met you uh, and Mike, and um, we started uh, doing things outside the school uh, in the adult world and working with the Department of Welfare while well, simultaneously I was working for the Department of Education. But uh, it was the beginning of finding kindred souls that were doing the work that sounded to me like it needed to be done and yay, finally. And so, uh, yeah, the, those were, were very formative years for me. And that's a couple chapters ahead of a lot of other things that happened in my life that had nothing to do with this social justice fire that seemed to always needing to be either quenched or fed one or the other burning over time or burning burning out which happens for a lot of people when they get really involved and committed so um simultaneously the other lives that you talk about were taking place i became interested in sports parachuting because i thought if there was going to be a war, I'd be able to be dropped behind the lines because it was, oh my. it was in the time, it was the time when people were digging shelters, you know, mm. the missile crisis, all that stuff. And so I became a sports parachutist and I joined a club. My parents were just furious with me, but um, it was a thrilling experience and I'm glad I did it. I would never do it again, but I stayed with it for a year or two. Um, until I crashed into a tomato field one year, and <laughs> it was a ground wind, and I couldn't, I couldn't dump my chute. And it just took me over all the rows in the tomato field until I was just covered, and everybody came running out because they thought it was blood, <laughs> but it wasn't. But that was sort of the end of my, end of that chapter, and then we became interested. My husband and I, when we bought the farm, we started working with a couple that we had met in Massachusetts um, uh, who were uh, much better positioned to be in the horse racing business than we were, but we were positioned to be in a way of raising horses because we had land and uh, we knew nothing about it. I had had a horse and a pony as a child, but that was a another whole story and um i i just like horses i love them and uh, so we spent many years breeding and not racing because that wasn't our thing at all but the person we were partnership with did the racing and we we actually had one of the, one of the babies that was foaled here ran in the kentucky derby so wow wow a lot of a lot of those stories uh, a lot of uh, beautiful memories of uh, the baby foals, um, sweetest creatures on earth. They beat bunnies in my book, but mm. uh, and so that's those are the chapters that stand out. And in, in, in all of this, um, a marriage and two wonderful kids, and um, and now five beautiful grandkids. 
And so the, the chapters just kind of fast forward through, in my mind anyway, that's the way they work. I don't know what kind of a book that's going to make. I think it's, it's pretty fascinating. I, 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 I didn't know about the jumping either, the parachuting. That's another yeah. new one to me. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm not surprised. I'm not at all surprised knowing you. But yeah, that's a whole new one for me. <laughs> so there, there have just been so many threads that have woven the fabric of my life that um, when I start to try and remember all of them, it is a tough road to hoe. And, and you know, I, I, I grew up with a, a, a specific um, religious uh, training, and um, I was dissatisfied with it by the time I was in high school. And I was searching everywhere. I looked into everything, you know, the uh, Wiccan, and the, uh, you name it, I... I looked at it and examined it and, and read about it. And finally, I didn't find it. Uh, it found me. Um, my husband uh, died when he was uh, in his 60s, and um, I was younger than he was. So I had to find something to make a living at. Uh, I thought it was going to be retiring, but it didn't happen. So I turned the farm into a bed and breakfast and wedding business. And um, uh, I got a call one day from, a, I thought it was a woman. The voice was so soft-spoken and had a quality that was almost um, ethereal to it. And I could hardly understand her. But I gathered that her daughter was getting married and they were looking for a location. So I found out that they were located around here. So I said, well, why don't you plan a visit? So the next day, a car drove up. And you can imagine my surprise when a person in a long, white, full-length robe and a beard and very long gray hair stepped out of the car and introduced himself and Contrary to what I'd written down, his name was not Sue. His name was Sudharman, and he was a local yogi who had moved to the area after studying with Sachidananda in Yogaville, and prior to that, Sachidananda's teacher in India. So he was a really different person, and I was uh, not quite sure what to do with him. And he immediately said, well... I can't afford to pay. I'm a yogi. I don't. I don't have any income, um, and I'm thinking to myself, right, another freeloader. And so then he said, I could give you a year's worth of yoga lessons. How about that? And I'm I said, well, again. Oh my I don't god! I know anything about yoga. It never <laughs> another... even occurred to me. I said, you mean all those exercise things? And he said, no. Well, we can do those. We can do those. But he said, I'll really teach you about yoga the philosophy of yoga a whole year's worth of lessons we can you can come to my place or i'll come to your place it doesn't matter and i thought well that doesn't sound like a bad deal so i ended up becoming his student and he was my official teacher and i ended up living in india for three or four months I remember i stopped at your place on the way out or on the way back I or something I anyway do. um so I learned a great deal. Um, that was 10 years ago, at least, and I'm still processing it. And the end of that story was, like all of the stories, it ended very strangely in the fact that um, after I came back from India, we spent a year more with lessons still going on, and then someone murdered him. And... I I have come to a place where I am literally not attached to anything anymore because that seems to have been my lesson that to learn in life is to not hang on. People come into my life, they leave my life. They're temporary, they're permanent, they're away, they're close. And it's not that I don't care about them or love them. But I have gotten to a certain degree of detachment to 
that aspect of what we call it. And he still uh, is around the yogi. Uh, I think I was telling you the story about the copper cup the other day. So back up, Sudharman, my teacher, was sort of cleaning house because I think he knew about how his life was going to end. And he was asking me, did I want this? Did I want that? And so he, he offered me a copper cup that was in his possession. And Sachidananda had given it to him. And then I remembered when I was in India, all the yogis had copper cups. And as it turns out, it's to purify the water. You keep the water in it and put a lid on it. Copper has a lot of um, healing properties. It also has destructive properties. I've heard of a new one if you put copper pennies in your garden. Slugs will go away from your plants because they get an electric shock from the pennies. And the most recent one has been an article that was in a magazine published in New York, I forget the name of it, sorry, um, where uh, drinking copper infused water is a detriment uh, or a deterrent, either one, to the new virus problem we're, we're battling with. And I figure, what the heck, it can't hurt. And I thought to myself when I read the article, I thought, I have a copper cup. And then I remember Sudarman giving it to me saying, you might need this someday. And I had it somewhere, but I'm sort of, I think I've pared down to nothing, but I really am on top of a hoarder complex, I think, looking around my studio right now with my books and my paints and, you know, this and that and the other thing. And I thought, well, I had a, I had a cupboard filled with meditation gear, which I don't really need anymore because I've learned to do, to kind of adjust mental states and gears to where I need to be without all the props, without the incense and the, you know, the furry rug and the, the poses and all that, that you have to do in the beginning in order to get your system ready to enter into a meditative state. And so I thought, where the hell did I put that cup? And I'm looking in my dishes, no cups, no cup. And I thought, well, maybe it's in my meditation cabinet. And I just remember all the stuff I'd been shoving in there that I wasn't using, packs of incense and all. And I opened it up, and they're sitting on the front, in the front of the cabinet, right at the edge of the shelf, as though I had just put it in there, was the copper cup. That I am sure Sudharman made sure that's where it was, because I knew he could do those kind of things. He had a lot of gifts and talents. One of them was being able to move, move objects through space to other places that, to move himself if he needed to. And um, he was a very gifted and talented yogi. And there was my copper cup waiting for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's been out of the cupboard now for the last two mm -hmm. weeks as the pandemic unfolds here in central PA. Oh, it's just beginning and uh, the hospitals out here aren't large and they're already overwhelmed. Even our big medical center is calling for donations if anybody has any. So and, I, don't, and, I don't know if they're and, into upper cups, but. <laughs> but, and there, and there is Sudarman winking and nodding to you. And mm -hmm. He's still with you and helping to yep. keep you sane yes. and straight and yep. on the right path and loving yep. you. Yes. Or when I, you know, when I think that there is no more connection left, um, he's on to other things, uh, a piece of paper will drop out of a book, a note that he wrote to me or something like that, you know. And in the process of all of that, his murder and the follow, following the aftermath of that, a person came out of nowhere who was a classmate of his and started interviewing me. She'd come here from Virginia and we'd have lunch together and she interviewed me about my knowledge of Sudharman and the years that I knew him. 
and um, she ended up writing a book about him. And she featured some of my artwork in her book. And now she's pursuing a film to see uh, if uh, that can help people to understand the, the life and times of a very interesting and unique human being. Um, I hope she's successful in it. Mm. So all of these seemingly unconnected mm. threads, that's why I'm an outlier. <laughs> They, they, they don't make a, a real cohesive statement. Uh, but it does. It fits together and it, it tells your story and it, it, it helps me understand um, more of who you are and what you do and why you do what you do. And for those who are just listening in and just getting to meet you, it's a fascinating story for them in a human's life. And I know there are many other chapters, many other tidbits and many mm -hmm. other things, some of them not so happy and some of them joyous and all that other, but that's created who you are and you haven't shunned them. I think that's the thing, you know, that I would say who is married to the first question is you're not, you, you don't shy away from the shit storm. You don't shy oh. away from what's coming down in buckets um you just ride into it and dig deeper well i i think that i think that's my purpose and my role is to um and i don't know what i'd call it really it's it's i found out more about my role when it finally occurred to me that my work as a professional person in the field of disabilities and my art finally merged that's another chapter because it didn't occur to me you know except i had i had done a painting of a, a friend of mine who had been a student for oh gosh quite a while when he was school age and he never developed speech uh and uh so when working with him we did find something that worked to help him have a communication system I saw another whole person and I painted that person immediately because I was so amazed at the transformation that had occurred right before my eyes he went from a person who had given up hope and that looks terrible on anybody um, but it's it's an awful thing to to let yourself go into it with, with another person and their pain. Um, and then to see it just blown out of the water and another person shows up because they can now communicate was amazing to me as a portrait painter. I just, I was astounded by it. And um, so I didn't start thinking, oh, I'll have to do, this one's portrait and that painting and it never occurred to me that I could use my art as a way to introduce other people to things that were going on in the world that didn't have a face. They were just a, a number or a statistic or a problem. And you know, when I think of that awful photograph, nobody will ever forget it, of that little girl during the Vietnam War that they napalmed that air and she was running out of the, no one will ever forget that picture. It's like one of those pictures and or nobody will ever forget the day World War II ended and the soldiers came home and that, that soldier was kissing a girl in the crowd. Those are, those are like images that become iconic and they you never forget them. And um, that's why I finally realized that I could use my art to create, if not iconic pictures, at least people's images that could tell somebody more than just a slogan or, you know, it's the March of Dimes and we're trying to raise money for, you know, blah, blah, blah. But a picture, a painting of a person that would represent a problem in our world today. And God knows there are enough of them. I could be painting until doomsday and I wouldn't get through the list. But I tried to get 
paintings that were um, poignant enough to to stop people in their hurrying and scurrying and take it in. Um, I just put put one of them on Instagram this morning. It was it's uh, the painting of my of this older woman here um, uh, because there are a lot of older people out there that are by themselves today and they don't have support. Read, they are living in poverty. And um, this has to be terrifying them as it is everybody, but these are kind of forgotten people. And um, I painted a whole series of forgotten people and, and I called it Painting Invisible People. And um, so I sent it out on Instagram today to remind anybody who has a relative or a friend or their neighbor or somebody just to kind of touch base with them um, they don't have to go visit them because we're socially distancing but how about a handwritten note and some pictures that you can actually hold in your hand that they can get out and put in their mirror in the corner of their mirror prop up on their dresser how about that little tender mercy it's easy enough to do but um so that's what my art has become uh representing uh circumstances and situations and using people as the image um to create awareness maybe uh to create more of a positive uh thing going on because um they are truly these older folks that live unassisted and unattended to and poor. Uh, they are to be commended. They hold the wisdom of a generation. They are our history and they're alone. And I want I don't want that for them. I want them I want them to be able to be talking to people and telling their stories like I'm telling mine. And uh it probably isn't gonna happen but I had to do that. I had to put that out on Instagram today to honor all the older people that are having such a struggle. And uh, the backlash I hear out there on the internet about, well, this is all happening because of older people. We wouldn't have to be doing all this if it wasn't for the older people. And um, it's, it, I'm back on the playground again and it's, I'm in third grade and it's like, I will say something about this because I can't not, I can't not stand up for their situation and their position in life. And um, they probably didn't, you are. Deserve, they didn't de deserve to end up this way, but right. you know, but that's, but that's who you are. That is who you are. That's right. And now using your art as part of your voice. Mm -hmm. and, and I know your, um, your series on Invisible People, I know you've taken that to various places. I know you've taken it to some colleges mm -hmm. to infiltrate the minds of the younger, the next generation, the next ones coming up. And that's, I yes. know that's part of your, part of what you do is it's not just about being solitary in your studio and painting. It's about then getting it out there and getting yeah. in people's faces. I, I took it to a school uh, that is preparing young lawyers to go out there because I, I really thought that was a great opportunity and it was because they are people who can change things. They can change them with their arguments, with uh, the levels of the law that they reach, judgeships and, you know, court, uh, Supreme Court even. Um, and I was so impressed with the reception that uh, that we got. My my friend Mark, who's one of the paintings, um, is a man with Down syndrome, but he is uh, he's a great presenter, and uh, people love to hear what he has to say. And so I learned early on that he was much more effective at presenting than I was, and I just turned him loose. And um, the people at the uh, school where we were in the university uh, welcomed him they they were so amazed and impressed with him and he probably changed what 
created a change point in those young people's lives that um, very few students that age could have appreciated and were able to take it and run with it. Um, and who knows how that's going to play out. I don't, I don't know. I don't care. I watched some of the kids come in. Well, they're not, they weren't kids. If you're in law school, it's like you're already through college and you're on to the next thing. But I watched some of them go around to the paintings. There were paintings from India. There were paintings from Haiti. And there were paintings from the United States. And some of the students were just crying. They didn't know. They, they just had no idea of what was going on, not just in their own country, but in all these, these other situations in India and in, in uh, Haiti. And I don't need anything else to happen except see that people get it, that the painting has spoken for itself. That's, that's as far as it goes, where I'm really passionate about it. I've got a website now and, you know, things are for sale and I do sell paintings, but, but um, that's sort of because I don't want to leave my kids stuck with a pile that is so high. They will come from neighboring districts to put the fire out after I'm dead. It's like, God, there's, you know, just so much work and, um, and I should work harder at the selling end of it, but it's, it's like I knew I wasn't a business person when I got into Bloomsburg University. <laughs> I was like, forget it, forget it. And so, you know, I, I, I'm okay on the front of producing the work, but I'm not so good at marketing it yeah. or selling it. And I really don't care at this point. So even though I should. Well, I think you're, well, I think you're doing a lot of work and a lot of good in the universe. And I wonder what's next on your list? Where is there a bucket list and what's in that? Or what are we next going to hear that Mary Lapis, what is she up to now? Is she back to jumping out of planes or what <laughs> no, the heck is no, next? No. Uh, but what's next for Mary? I've or been trying to, I've been trying to visualize this. Uh, and, um, I had a real, I told you the other day, I had, was working on a picture of a family member and I had been laboring over it because I'd learned some new methodologies and new painting techniques from a wonderful guy that I drove to his place to take lessons before this virus thing hit. And I was so excited about all the processes, but um, I have to find a place where I can meld the new information with the painter I am. and. The guy I, I went to study with told me that. He said, I, I'm not teaching you these things so you can paint like me. I'm teaching you so that you can paint better than what, what you paint and how you paint. And I was trying to be just like him <laughs> because that's, you know, what you do when you start out. And now I have to find the middle ground somewhere. So I was painting this painting of a family member and... At certain points of the painting, it really looked good, and I was excited about it. And then the other day, I just looked at it, and I thought, this is a bunch of crap. I just scraped it all down. Rosa was screaming, no, no, you can't do that. And I, I just, I realized it just, it was turning into just a pile of paint. It was not even a painting. It was a picture that I was trying to, that I had in my head, or photographs, and I, and I, a picture of somebody else's way of painting, and I just thought, this is crap. So it's now in the burn pile, but I learned a lot. And I'm so, still uh, oh. holding my head and shuddering because I saw it and it's beautiful and it, it was him. It was this mm -hmm. many, sweet many young many man yes. in many, many ways. Times. And I saw a couple of earlier versions and then I was, you did what? You scraped it and it's in the bin and what? No, 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 no. Yeah. But I'm not an artist in the way that you are and that process well, there will be is another unimaginable painting. to me. There will be another painting that is a painting. And a painting is not a picture. A picture is something you take with a camera and 
and it's that's it how whatever it is and i had created a picture but it wasn't a painting and that's what that's where i am you think with this with this hiatus from the world we're all going through that i would be just churning out work and i am not i've come to a dead stop so i have to i have to let my right brain and left brain get together in a meeting somewhere um and decide some things because i don't have a clear direction this happens to me frequently so i'm not alarmed by it but um it's like the clock is ticking <laughs> better get going here on the next thing and uh, i will i will uh, but um just not this week and maybe not and this week. <laughs> And I've seen this with you at various mm -hmm. other stages. And then I've also witnessed whether it's divine intervention or something that's percolating deep inside that comes to the surface. All of a sudden, then it's like, oh my God, Mary's recreating herself in a whole new way now. Yeah. Something yeah, new, that's entirely different. That's what happens for me. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> I, and I think you more than probably anybody else I've ever known. I've seen that where you, you do kind of go into a lull and you are good enough. I've watched you get a little stir crazy about it, but um, I will admit that. But for the most yeah. part, you sit with it and you, as uncomfortable as it may be, you sit with it and you don't deny it. And you almost yeah. watch yourself and allow the next to emerge. You don't push it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a regrouping process that uh, I do fiddle. I fiddle with stuff, you know, to, just to keep my hand in, but I don't really produce much during these times. And uh, I need to get going here soon. And, uh, but like I said, nothing's really changed for me like it has for the rest of the world because everybody's dealing with this new circumstance of, social distancing and isolation and um uh and they're everybody's what do we do what do we do looking up for lists of things you know, i have plenty to do i'm not bored i'm never bored i don't ever use that word but um i keep going through older work that i never finished and there's just nothing nothing percolating uh, except a knowledge that I remember what this last teacher said. I'm not teaching you this stuff so you can paint like me. I'm teaching it so you can do better what you do. So I have to define that better in my mind. What is it that I do? So I'm thinking of a new term. Everybody's using the term in the art world. Now let's see if I can think of it. Um, uh, contemporary realism that's the buzzword mm -hmm. today and those are the paintings that are so real that you have to wonder is it a photograph you know and I don't like that part because I want it clear that it's I want it clear that it's a painting and I you do that with the way the strokes are laid in and the way the colors the palette that you use and all that and um, I realized when I was painting this last painting that I scraped down, it's because I started moving in that direction of, and I think the word will have to be, um, contemporary impressionism. Hmm. Because I like, I like that part of painting where you do it with one stroke, not with thousands of strokes. I'm watching a lot of people do this online now where they're painting individual hairs on the mm. horse's neck. And it's a beautiful process when you look at it done, but it's tedious beyond belief. And I don't have that kind of patience. So um, I have to look at what will capture the moment. And so I'm, that's my next thing, capturing the moments that are paintings, not um, not would be photographs so mm -hmm. i've got to find my place in there so mm -hmm. can't wait to see i, I can't, can't either i mean yeah. i don't know if i can wait just 
<laughs> it's, getting, it's getting a little hard and I'm getting a little long in the tooth to be waiting around for something to happen. So mm -hmm. I'm going to have to push it along a little more than I usually do. So going back to the first question. Who am I? So after okay. all of this wonderful journey and storytelling, who is Mary? Who is Mary Lapis? She's a painter that's in between jobs right now. <laughs> 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 um, you know, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm a miss. Um, interactions with my family uh, is just across the street. But the, they move in the world out there, and um, so I'm not uh, I'm not in contact with them really, except across the yard, sort of. Hi, how are you doing? They check in with me, but but um, I'm a grandma, and I'm a mom, and I am a painter, and I guess a writer, and a pianist, and a philosopher, and I'm an idea person. I I often wished when I was a teenager that I could become so good at one thing. It's the, all I wanted to do then. I admired people who had that focus, you know, because they became a doctor at 22, you know, or I didn't want to become a doctor, but just that focus. And I have never had that. I've had like, scattershot focus on so many things because so many things interest me um you know fledgling woodworker i'm a sort of a jack of all trades around the farm carpentry and you know it just i'm always fixing something either tangible social a painting, piece of music. I'm always tweaking it and trying to make it better. And um, uh, I don't know why nobody's standing over my shoulder watching. <laughs> but this morning, I was, I was up at some ridiculous hour, and I happened to see that my friend Mark um, had at the end of the day yesterday commented on the Instagram because that's his favorite painting. He always wanted his painting to hang next to her oh, because he say to me, that's who I was waiting for my voice. Mm -hmm. And so we always hung the two paintings together uh, on, on the show circuit. And um, so anyway, I noticed that he had uh, mentioned that he saw it online and and um, and then I realized, oh my God, he asked me to review his uh, a thing he put together for a presentation to people about alternative communication. And I never got back to him. It was like two weeks ago, and then the virus thing hit, and it was like crazy. So I started taking it apart, what he had done, which was fine and dandy, except. I thought he could probably make a really professional uh, presentation out of it. So I told him what I thought he should change just in what he already had. And then I said, take it a little further because, and I said, how about asking your sister, his sister happens to teach at Temple University, I think, or somewhere down in Philly. And, um, and then, uh, to ask who the heck else was it? Somebody else that we both know. Anyway, to see if he couldn't get a grant to have some somebody do a professional video with what he had put together. Because there were some pretty pertinent points in there about eye gaze and I added a bunch of things that I know he deals with, um, sensory stuff and and all that, so that it was a well-rounded um, pr presentation because he does that very well. And uh, so there I was at four o'clock this morning doing that. <laughs> and it's like 
Mark and I go back and forth, me into his world and, and trying to see what I can do to help to um, whatever it might be. But we have stayed in touch now for 45 years. Because wow. I first met him when he was coming into preschool. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he's now 50, going to be 51 in May. Wow. Wow. So we've had a long, long standing connection. So I'm, I'm hoping he can find, uh, if, why can't I remember the, I just wrote it this Graciela? morning. Graciela? Graciela? No, but that's a good point because I mm -hmm. said something about the university connection. Mm -hmm. um, the sister could provide that, but um, mm -hmm. cause she's in communication stuff. But yeah, Graciela would be good. And um, something, oh well. That's all right. It'll come it's to fun. you. As long as I got to Mark, that's the main thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, that um, the, that's the day's little bit that I mm -hmm. already have had to tweak. And we can, we can make a better thing out of this. And you could have a, you know, a commercial product. And you could, you know, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but I think it points out another thing that I would add to the list of the who is Mary, and that is you are a steadfast friend. You are. Yes, I am. I am. Wow. Uh, I have uh, this cadre of people that surround me, and you're one of them, uh, and have supported me every step of the way, it seems. The, well, I couldn't have done it without that support. Um, and uh, we are in each other's lives almost constantly. Um, they're the people that you can always just pick it up right where you left off, like a day hasn't gone by, because that's how deep the roots go. All part of the same tree. Absolutely. You know? And I'm glad, I'm glad we're in the same nutty tree together, honey. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I want you in my corner, that's for sure. <laughs> and you in mine, and you certainly have been that. So thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. Thank you for this time. Thanks for all that you do. Mahalo. It's my pleasure, and I wouldn't have had it any other way. Take care of yourself out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love each other up. This series on being a service warrior is brought to you by Networks for Training and Development Incorporated via funding by the Philadelphia and Northumberland Counties Behavioral Health Intellectual Disability Services in Pennsylvania and with the help of Joe Sterling of Joe Doggy Productions, Waikapu, Hawaii. Many thanks to all our guests and fellow firewalkers for sharing their wisdom, learnings, and joy with us. Thank you.